Welcome to this basic introduction to photography. Today we're going to be learning all the nuts and bolts of your camera and how to use those to take the best photographs possible. So let's go ahead and get started. Now we're going to be answering a lot of questions in this course, some of which are, what is a DSLR and how does it work? What do the terms aperture, f-stop, shutter speed, ISO, and film speed mean? And how do I adjust to get artistic effects while keeping the right exposure for each shot that I'm taking? And exposure just means the amount of light that's being let into your camera. Now let's start with one of the most basic questions possible. What is a camera? Well, a camera is any light tight box with a hole in it. So you just want to make sure that no light is being let into the camera except for the hole, which is usually where the lens is. Um, and that light we will be controlling to get the best photograph possible. The quality and ability of cameras can vary greatly. And though each camera can provide you with different tools, most do function similarly and all require you to be the most important piece in the photography puzzle. Now in this course, we're specifically going to be focused on DSLR cameras. And DSLR stands for Digital Single Lens Reflex. Before digital, these cameras were just referred to as SLR cameras, single lens reflex cameras. But both function largely the same. And DSLR, all DSLR cameras will function with a mirror in the body of the camera that shows you exactly what your lens is seeing through your viewfinder. So whatever you see in your lens will be reflected on this little mirror in here up to the viewfinder that you'll be looking at and it'll give you a more accurate understanding of what your lens is seeing. Now, all cameras, all DSLR cameras have three main controls that work together to control exposure and artistic effects. Most other cameras also have these controls but all DSLRs will definitely have them. These controls are aperture, shutter speed, and film speed, which can also be referred to as ISO. Let's look at aperture first. An aperture is the hole that lights let into your, or lets light into your camera. The aperture can be opened and closed to different widths known as f-stops. So if we look over here in our diagram, we can see these f-stops. And one thing to note, the smaller the number, the larger the aperture, or the wider the aperture. And the wider the aperture, the more light that's being let into your camera. Because we have a wider hole, we have more light that's spilling into the camera. So if we have more light, that means we'll have a lighter image, and a more exposed image. Conversely, the smaller holes, f16 and f11, will have less light being let in, and thus they will be a darker image. So you can see the f-stops help control exposure. They also control an artistic effect called depth of field. And that's how deeply we can see the space in our photo. So how much of the depth in our photo is actually in focus. And let's look at how aperture actually controls that. So when we're looking at aperture and depth of field, one thing to kind of take note of is that the aperture and the depth of field almost work in opposite. So the wider the aperture, the narrower the depth of field. So here we have a wide aperture of 1.4 and f2. We can see th these two options of apertures are both very wide. These types of apertures are actually used to control a, or to portray a narrow depth of field, which is also referred to as selective focus. These images only show one slice of space in focus. So let's look at what those might look like in a photograph. So here we have a narrow depth of field or selective focus photograph. And this photograph would have been taken with a very wide aperture. And we know that it is a selective focus because we can see that the hands and the sparkler here are very well focused, but everything in the background is starting to blur. So that one slice of space up here in the foreground has been in focus and we're losing kind of all of that focus as it starts to recede back. Another example here with strawberries, you can see we have three strawberries kind of almost in a row, but because we have a narrow depth of field or a selective focus, we have chosen to put our focus on this first strawberry and we've lost the focus on our receding strawberries. Here you can see, see the same demonstration of selective focus, but in this image you can see that we're starting to even lose a little bit of focus in the foreground. 
When you have a wide uh, aperture and you're creating that selective focus, you still get to decide where you place your focus. So you can use your lens to focus on a specific part, whether that be in the foreground, middle ground, or background. And then the fact that you have a wide aperture will actually just blur out the remaining parts of your image. Another great example of that, here we can see the mouse and the computer that are really focused. Everything in the foreground is starting to lose its focus. Everything in the background is as well. So again, that would be a very wide aperture. If we look at that here, f1.4, f2. And that would create that very narrow slice of space that's in focus. And one last example of that, this little cute little snail that is in focus. And if you notice, even along the concrete here, you can see how well focused that concrete is and then how we're losing that focus in the foreground and in the background. Now, this is a great technique if you want to bring focus to one area and you want to kind of downplay some distracting things in the background. Um, so this is a great way to use an artistic effect in a simple little setting with your aperture to make sure that you're getting the right focus on the right thing. So let's imagine that we don't just want to focus on one thing. We want to show everything in focus. How do we do that? Well, as you might imagine, we're actually going to go to the other end of the spectrum with our f-stops, and we're going to find a very, very narrow aperture setting of f11 or f16. And when we choose those settings, we get shots that look a little bit more like this. So here you can see we have all of our photo in focus. Now, obviously, um, your camera is going to work much like your eyes, and your eyes have limitations to them. So off in the distance, we do start to lose focus. But here we can see we have foreground that has much detail and is very focused and crisp. We have middle ground that's also very focused and crisp, crisp and we can see all the details, and the background is as well. So here we have a little bit of, of less space portrayed, but again, we can see the detail in these different parts in the background, middle ground, foreground. We're not losing a lot of focus in any one of those areas, so you can tell that we must have a narrow aperture which gives us a wide depth of field. Another example, now we are starting to lose a little focus in the background here, but still for the most part, we've got a lot of detail in the background, middle ground, and the foreground of the people. And exposure doesn't necessarily have to do with, with depth of field. So in this shot, you can see we have a lighter background and we have a very dark foreground. But even in this foreground, you can see a lot of the detail of the hair and a lot of the detail of the wrinkles of the clothes. So you know it's not a focus issue. It's, it's a different exposure that's going on. And we're still getting that wide depth of field. Similarly here, we've got these dark but very detailed pine trees, and then we've got all the detail of the city in the distance. And then this is a very obvious illustration where you can see all of the background, middle ground, and foreground tulips are all perfectly focused, almost identically. So it has that very clear depth of field, wide depth of field to it. Here again, great example of a wide depth of field, and we can see all of the detail in the waves, in the foreground, middle ground, and then we see all of this texture in the land in the background. So hopefully that was a good illustration of how aperture controls depth of field. But if you remember, aperture is just one of three settings that we use to control exposure in our camera. So let's move on to the second setting, which is our shutter or our shutter speed. So the shutter is actually what opens and closes to let light into the camera. So it would close and open using your aperture to show your camera whatever you know light is outside of the camera. And the shutter speed is the amount of time that that shutter is open. And it can be adjusted to control exposure. So if we have a long shutter speed, if our shutter is open for a longer amount of time, we get more light in the camera and our images are lighter. If we have a very short shutter speed, we have less light in the camera and then our images are darker. Shutter speed can also be used to show or stop motion in a photo. Now, shutter speed settings range from slow, and that's 1 to 60, to standard, which is 125, to 
fast, which is 250 to 4000. Now here we see an old SLR camera, not a DSLR. And here's the settings that use to control the shutter speeds. Now you can see in this camera we only go up to 1000. But something else I want you to note here. Notice that 60 has an X at it. And the reason there's an X there is because anything below 60 will require you to actually use a tripod. Because if you're holding the camera at 60, the camera is going to actually show the motion of your breath and your heartbeat. So sometimes you can get away with still shooting and holding it at 60, but um, just to be safe, try a tripod from 60 down. Now another thing to keep in mind here, even though, um, you know, it seems like one and two and four and eight kind of um, go upward. One thing you want to think about, um, one is actually the longest exposure other than bulb here, which is what B stands for. But one is actually, if we take any of these settings and make them into a fraction and put one over the top, one is one second. So two is one half of a second. Four is one quarter of a second, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see when we get to 1,000, we're at one one thousandth of a second, and that's extremely fast. And even though you might think that one second would be fast, one second is actually extremely slow when it comes to photography. So just something that you want to keep in mind there. These are all technically fractions, but we still refer to them as one, two, four, eight, et cetera. So if we have these slow shutter speeds, they are going to show motion. So they would actually kind of show motion as a blur. If we have these fast shutter speeds, they are actually going to stop motion. So you could freeze somebody mid-air. So let's go ahead and see what we would do if we wanted to show motion in our photo. So showing motion would require a slow shutter speed. So this is a shutter speed that's got to be below 60 or 1 60th of a second. And um, here, it's very interesting. We can still see a lot of these subjects that are really well focused, but the things that are moving become blurs. So the reason that uh, the people in here are not blurs are because they're not really moving. They're just kind of standing still waiting for this train. But the train becomes a blur because it's just whipping by. And we've got that very slow shutter speed that's capturing that motion as it's going. Here's another example of a slow shutter speed. Obviously, the trees and the rocks are not moving, so they're not going to really have much of a change of appearance. But in a slow shutter speed, water becomes almost this ghostly kind of image. So you can see all of the kind of motion blur that's happening from that rushing water going over those rocks. Another great example here. Now, there's a reason, even though these guys are moving, there's a reason that we're seeing them almost as static while the rest of the surroundings seem to be moving around them. And that's because the photographer is probably also on a skateboard moving at the same rate that these subjects are. So even though we usually show motion in things that are actually moving, if we're moving along with those things, then we will tend to show the motion in the surroundings rather than in the subjects. Here's an opposite example of that. So here we can see all the moving things blurring. Even some of the people we can see blurring, so we know this is a very slow shutter speed. But we can see all of the static surroundings, all of the things that are not moving, really crisply focused. So we know that this must be a camera that's set on a tripod and it's set to a very slow shutter speed. Here's another example where we can see the subject actually in focus, but everything around the subject is out of focus. And the reason we know this is a slow shutter speed and not necessarily a depth of field issue is because of these lines. We can see th that the blur is actually moving in the same direction as the people would probably be moving. So we know what probably happened here is that the photographer had the camera on a tripod and they panned the camera at the same rate as the motorcycle here. Whoops, kind of move that around, move that back. There we go. So if I was trying to take a shot like this, I would turn my camera on the tripod and then as these people rode by, I would follow them with the camera and then click the shutter so I could capture them while everything else became a motion blur in the background.
Now here's another motion blur. We know this is a motion blur because again, we can see the directional type of blur lines that are happening with this carousel. But of course, the people standing around who aren't moving very much, they're perfectly in focus. And finally, we have this shot here at night in London. You can tell that there's motion blur because again, it's the directional lights of the buses, the cars, all of that. Now, with something like this, you might even have some people in this shot that might have been moving but might not have had enough light on them to really show. If the people weren't moving, like I think you can see a, a person back here in the distance who wasn't moving, you can actually still see them very well. And of course, any static things like um, the telephone booth is really crisp and clear um, because it's not moving at all. Now, what if you want to stop or freeze motion? So where we had a very slow shutter speed of below 60, from here on out, if you wanted to freeze motion, you would want to have, I usually aim for above 500. So if you can do above 500 on your shutter speed, um, you can capture some of these motions kind of midair and frozen. Um, usually a thousand and above is really good for that too. Um, but here we can see, you know, this is a frozen motion of these women jumping over these hurdles. Frozen motion here of this dog. And a lot of times um, these fast shutter speeds are used primarily in things like sports or to kind of capture these live action kind of moments that you wouldn't be able to really see in detail otherwise. So I wouldn't typically be able to see all the detail of the water flipping off of the ball here and the intense look in the dog's face as he's going to get that. Here you can kind of freeze any animal in midair. Um, flying animals, you know, if you don't want to see them as a big blur, you've got to have that fast shutter speed. You can jump up in the air and freeze yourself midair almost as if you're flying. That's always fun to do, and all you need for this is that fast shutter speed. And again, things like water are really exciting when you have a, a fast shutter speed because you can see all of the individual little droplets and it's just kind of looking at something with, with a slightly different perspective than we see it in everyday life. And here's kind of a combination of the last two shots, jumping and water combined, so you can see like the little droplets and it's just kind of a fun, almost floating image that we're getting here because we have that fast shutter speed. All right, so now we have aperture, we have shutter speed, and these are two controls of the three that we need to control our overall exposure. Um, our final control is ISO. Now, ISO is also, con con or also referred to as film speed, and it actually used to be the, the um, setting on your individual rolls of film that you would get. But now, of course, since we don't have film and DSLRs, this is a setting that you can actually adjust in your camera. And your film speed or your ISO will actually control your camera's sensibility or your camera's sensitivity to light. Now, it used to be that you would get a, a roll of film at a certain film speed, and that film had a certain sensitivity to light. But now, because we can adjust these things in our camera, we can adjust the sensitivity at any point. So we have more flexibility than we did before when we had to stick to the same sensitivity for an entire roll of film. Now the ISO can be adjusted in your camera settings. Usually the settings for ISO, sometimes you have to kind of go into the menu a bit more than you would for shutter speed or aperture, um, but it will depend on the camera that you have. And aside from sensitivity to light, ISO also controls something called photo noise. And photo noise is basically just the graininess of your photo. So let's kind of look at ISO a little bit more in detail here. So, ISO controls exposure, but it doesn't control exposure in the same way that aperture and shutter speed control exposure. Aperture and shutter speed control exposure by controlling how much light actually gets into the camera. Once that light is in the camera, ISO controls exposure by how sensitive your camera is to the light. So let's look at what that looks like here in photos. Here we have an ISO 200 and we can see that we have a darker image because our camera is less sensitive to that light. 
So ISO 400, a little bit brighter, ISO 800, a little bit brighter, and finally 1600, very bright. So the higher the ISO, the more sensitive to light your camera will be. The only problem with that is that the higher the ISO, the more photo noise is visible. So here we can see ISO 100 is very soft and very kind of, you know, smooth. There's not a lot of um, what we would call noise or static in the image. As that starts to go up, you can start to see the graininess, the noise level of that photo get a little bit more extreme. So it's just something that you want to keep in mind because sometimes you'll need to set it on that high ISO so that you can get um, more brightness in your camera or more brightness in your final image. But with that, you're also getting that higher photo noise. So just something to keep in mind there. All right, so now that we know these three parts of our camera, we need to start using them together to control exposure, how much light gets in and how sensitive that camera is to the light. So in order to get the proper exposure, we have to use our aperture, shutter speed, and ISO in kind of uh, all together <laughs> to uh, let in the exact amount of light necessary for each shot. So for each shot, it's going to be different because every time we angle our camera in one direction or the, or the other, we're going to get a different amount of light in. So we have to always be monitoring to see how much light we need. Now, if we have too little light, we will have an underexposed or a dark photo. If we have too much light, we'll have an overexposed or a light photo. Now, our camera has a light meter, and this is what we are going to depend on to know if we have the right amount of light with the settings that we're currently using. So let's look here at some different problems that we might have if we're not getting the right exposure. If we get overexposed photos, again, that's going to be a very light image. So what could have possibly gone wrong with this image. Well, we had too much light getting let into the camera, and we know we can let in too much light in a couple of different ways. It might have been because the aperture was too wide. So maybe the next shot that we take, we you know make a smaller f-stop setting so that we don't have as wide of an aperture and we can get a better exposure. Our shutter speed might have also been too long, so maybe we have a shorter sh shutter speed next time and then we get a better exposure as well. Our ISO setting could also have been too high, so we could also just adjust the ISO and try the shot again and maybe we would get a better exposure. Conversely, we can have underexposed images and those are happening because we're not getting enough light into the camera and that happens because possibly the aperture was too small. Maybe the shutter speed was too short, so we could just have a longer shutter speed next time and get in more light. And possibly the ISO setting was also too low. So these are all things that we could adjust to get the proper exposure next time. Now, if we're looking through our camera and we're trying to get the right exposure, we have to depend on something called a light meter. Now here in this image, you can see the light meter for this Canon camera down here. And chances are, in most cameras, when you also look through the viewfinder and slightly press down on the shutter, you're going to also see the same light meter right at the bottom of your viewfinder image. So you're going to be able to use your light meter looking through your viewfinder or also looking at your screen. But I tend to encourage people to look through your viewfinder because if you look at your screen, you might not be directing your camera exactly at the subject that you want to meter. Now, as you're looking at your light meter, um, you'll see a little notch that will show you if you have the right amount of light, which will be right at the center, or if you have too little or too much light, which will be, depending on the camera, over to the left or over to the right. So once you see that, you're going to adjust your aperture or shutter speed on your camera until that bar comes back to the middle of that light meter. And if you can't get the right exposure just adjusting your aperture and your shutter speed, go and re reset your ISO to a different ISO settings and setting and then try the aperture and shutter speed adjustments again until you get right at that sweet spot in the middle. So let's look a little bit closer here at the light meter. This is a type of light meter that's usually on a Nikon camera. And you can see, or actually I think this one is also for a Canon camera. 
So, um, but most of them will have this kind of middle bar, and then you're going to have either a negative or a positive. And sometimes they'll just be little marks off to the side, sometimes they'll be actual numbers. But all you need to know is that if you're too far to the negative, you don't have enough light. If you're too far to the positive, you have too much light. And you always want to try to bring it back to the center point. So uh, make sure your camera is set to manual mode when you're adjusting your settings. Otherwise, that's not going to do you a lot of good. And then once you find the right exposure point, you may want to, just to make sure, you may want to take a photo that's one stop higher, which would be this plus one, and one stop lower, which is this negative one. And that we, we call that bracketing, and that just kind of gives you a range of photos so that you know maybe something looks pretty good here, but sometimes your camera isn't always right. Sometimes you have to be the boss of the camera and say, you know, you're thinking the light is looking good here, but it's really not. It's looking a little bit better when it's a little bit more exposed. So if you take a range of photos for each shot that you're you're shooting and you get a couple different exposures and you bracket, then you'll just have more to choose from later on and that's always a smart choice. So let's review. First off, a camera is a light type box with a hole in it. The three main settings that affect exposure and artistic effects are aperture, shutter speed, and ISO, which is also referred to as film speed. An aperture is the hole that lets light into the camera and it also controls the depth of field. The shutter is what opens and closes to let the light in and it controls the showing and stopping of motion. ISO is, what's, is what used to be film speed and it controls the camera sensitivity to light as well as the amount of photo noise that you're going to see in your photos. And finally, don't forget, you are the most important part of the photography puzzle. So no matter what camera you're using, make sure that you learn all of the little ways to control that specific camera and practice, practice, practice to take great photos. Good luck.